Hello, my dear followers. This is Ciencia Peru TV, and today we are going to talk about education in USA with our friend Victor Coronel. In, you know, in USA, there is a controversy about this subject, very important for the future of every country. Uh, how are you, Victor? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you guys there? Yeah, you will spend uh, many decades in the United States. You know very well uh, the problem of education. And uh, it seems to be there is a, a controversy about uh, this so-called um, core, basic core or something like that. Huh? Mm -hmm. What is it? May you explain us? Yes. Which is the problem? What is the problem? Uh, the problem basically is that in the United States, the federal government, the central government, dictates some policy. And then the states, which are 50 states, they have to accept the basic policies of the federal government if they want to get funding from them. And they can also set up their own rules. So in addition to that, every state is divided into counties. So the equivalent to Peru would be the federal government, el gobierno central, then the states, los departamentos, then the counties, las provincias, and then los distritos o pueblos, Eh, aquí son the villages, towns, townships, etc. Entonces, las provincias, the counties, they set up their own school department. And they set up the salaries of the teachers. They set up the money that they allocate or they give to the schools. And they decide the school policy based on what the federal government tells them and the state tells them. So that's what they do there. So what happens in the United States is that the areas where the rich live, they have very good school systems because they charge a lot of taxes, impuestos. They charge a lot of taxes to the people that live in the area. And therefore they can afford to pay the teachers a good salary. They can afford to have great facilities. So personally, I have known several high school teachers in the rich people's high schools that make more money than a university professor sometimes. Their facilities are very good. Now, if you go to a public school in a poor area, the education is not that good. They don't have very good facilities. And therefore, the percentage of students that go to college from those public schools is very low, maybe 10%, maybe 15%. There. Whereas in the Whereas in the prosperous or rich high schools, the percentage of kids that go to college is almost 100%. So the United States realized that not educating people actually represents a problem, not only from the, for the poor, but for the rich too, because they cannot be richer. Talent is being wasted. People are not being educated. And you don't have the technicians. You don't have the engineers. You don't have the professionals needed to run the country as efficiently. So they saw that it was in the national interest to create a set of standards, a minimum standards that every student was guaranteed access to. 
So every, every student that graduated from high school, whether it be from a public or a private school, had to have at least some basic core there. So that was the program called Common Core, which was thought about in 2002, 2003. Every, everybody, everybody, had to, to follow this basic course in, the, in principle. If they want to accept federal government. Yeah, federal accept. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Of course. And so in the 2008, 2010, when Obama became president, Barack Obama became president of the United States, he pushed for the common core. And he knew that many states will accept that because they needed money to increase the salary of the teachers. And they wanted to increase the salary of our teachers for political reasons too, because that way they could say, I am an education governor. I am an education uh, major of the city, um, et cetera, et cetera there. I'm raising the salary of the teachers by 20%, 10%, 15%, et cetera. So it was in their interest to adopt, accept Common Core. So they accepted Common Core then. But as soon as Common Core was accepted, they say, all right, the students should be able to read carefully, read with understanding, not just read per reading, but reading with understanding. Then. So then you ask the question, okay, what should they read? And here is where politics and religion gets into the game there. People said, you know, religious people said, of course they should understand the Bible. They, they should read the Bible. Other people said, no, uh, we are not that religious. I prefer, I prefer the capital of um, Marx. <laughs> yeah, they, they said, all right, read something else. Uh, somebody, as you said, somebody would say, read Das Kapital, the Marx. Or somebody said, no, no, no. Uh, people get the, a creative imagination by reading fiction there. Let's read uh, Jules Verne, for example. You know, travel to the moon there, or travels to the center of the earth. So that kind of thing, that kind of debating. So eventually it has polarized the nation now. There are people that object to reading uh, books that were considered very popular in the 60s. And now they're saying, no, no, no. They create a bad image of what young people should do. And so therefore we should ban those books. So in many states, including Florida, for example, uh, they have banned certain books, or they have said that that book is not appropriate for the high school. So you cannot use those books for teaching. So the country is becoming fractured now. They are dividing. There are areas where the conservatives dominate. And so therefore they try to set up changes on the common core in there. So it's not common anymore and they are eliminating it. So for example, some parents say, you know, the way you are teaching them uh, how to multiply is not the right way. I was taught how to multiply a different way. I was told to do fractions a different way and that's the best way. And so that even that is being debated now, what, what to do there. So, also the idea that they should give more money to the poorest schools. They say, well, they waste the money, the kids don't care. So we are just putting more money into something that is going to fail. That's their argument. Now others are saying, look, and they have shown it with numbers. They have shown that the, if you don't put money into their education, you will spend money in incarceration, in sending people to prison. It is costing the United States 
about $200 per day to have a person in prison. Now, to educate the person, to train the person, it costs about $70 to $90 a day. So 70, it's cheaper. It's cheaper to educate, yes. but it is more profitable and it's also more politically positive to send people to prison because what you see on TV is you see this guy who is drugged, stealing from you or your friend, and you say, the judge says, oh, send him to jail for one month. And people protest. And they say, only one month, send them for 10 years. So a lot of people are sent to prison for a long time. That is good news for the companies that run prisons because they're gonna get more money. The more people you put in prison, the more money they get there. So everything is uh, around money. <laughs> yes, in the end, yes. But what about science? Because uh, here in Peru, we'd like to, to get some uh, more, more courses on science. Well, we have the same problems here. Uh, first of all, in the 50s, we realized that we were losing a significant percentage of scientists because we ignore women there. The books, if you look at the textbooks in physics for high school and college, they usually picture men or men or people playing games for men there. American football or the picture of a man kicking a soccer ball, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They didn't show a woman combing her hair, for example, and then show how the forces on the comb add up to zero and therefore the comb stays at rest there. Oh, so they didn't do examples that show that women belong to science and therefore not many women were going into physics, not many women going into uh, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the problem. And the United States realized that they were losing a significant portion of their population and they said that has to change. And that has changed a little bit. Now we have, uh, for example, in the field of medicine, over 50% of the doctors now are women. And we hope that's the same thing in other fields. For example, in computer programming, that is also increasing the percentage of women. The number of women in physics has increased too, but it's still not 50%. Okay, but uh, Victor, uh, in this moment in the United States, there are fanatic people uh, around this uh, kind of religious uh, belief. Um, they, they are people again, the evolution theory is a strong, a strong movement. Um, I don't know if it's strong, but it's very, very loud. So they make a lot of noise. They, they have uh, the television industry gives them access to, to their public. And so they, they are very vocal too. They are organized too. For example, there is a group that is still believes that the earth is flat. So when you show them pictures of the round earth, they say- You are, you are, uh, you, you are joking, huh? No, 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 no. You can, you can do that. You can go to their web page, and they, they publicize the fact that all oh, those pictures are fake. Well, those pictures are just uh, using Photoshop. You Photoshop them, the earth is flat. So you have people that believe that the earth, you know, was. Uh, set up only about 5,000, 10,000 years ago, according to the Bible. 
that uh, they don't believe in the theory of evolution. So there are not, not, not a majority by any means, it's a minority, but it's a significant minority and it's a loud minority. And so whenever you have uh, a school board meetings, because the schools have to meet a certain number of times a year, they appear at the meetings, they are very vocal, they complain loudly, they are saying they are teaching our children nonsense. So. Tell me, but there is also in the United States, the so-called minorities, huh? Latinos or so on. They also ask uh, some special courses for them? Well, yeah, they, they had, a, they, they had a, first of all, they complain uh, with, with the people, minorities actually, right now they are the majority because now uh, the number of blacks and Hispanics and Orientals in the United States is bigger than the number of whites. That has happened since about, I would say 20, 30 years. So they're the, they're the majority, but they are not together, they're a fraction. For example, the Hispanics have a lot of racism against blacks. And you can see people from other countries that come to the States that say, they say, I'm not black, I'm Moreno, I'm dark, but I'm not black. And they are obviously black. They were black in the United States. It's, uh, it's not accepted by people from Africa. They were black, yeah, they accept it. There, there are certain words that they, they don't accept, like there is something called the N word. And that is considered a big insult, you know, which, it, which it is. So, but coming back to the point of what happens to the curriculum regarding the minorities, of course they have complained about it, about the history, about the lack of representation in music and literature. For example, Americans do not read until they get to college or university, they don't read any of the works from Latin Americans or Africans or Asians. All for them is Aristotle, the Greeks, the Europeans, the British cultures. So obviously the black students say, it, it looks like we, we never had somebody who wrote history or, or music. And of course that has been the way that many countries dominated other countries. The first thing that you did was to say that their music was bad or was evil music. So for example, in the case of of the Incas, when the Spaniards came, they say that the Inca music was the devil's music. So the church actually ordered the burning of you know, there is Inca in musical Peru, instrument. You know, in Peru, you, uh, in the Spanish, in the Spanish is um, uh, like extirpación de idolatría. How do you say it in English? <laughs> Yeah, 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 the destruction of idolatry. Yeah, they, they, that's, that's that was Spaniard, it. Spaniard theory. Yeah, no, but that's not just a Spaniard, that's universal. The first thing you go, you do when you want to destroy a country is you destroy their culture there. You say their music is not good, their literature is not good, their food is not good. You know, like for example, when I was a kid, in Lima, people would laugh if you ate cancha or if you had breakfast with machica there or you ate cachanga there. You know, so. Even, even quinoa. Yeah, only quinoa. All, many, many products were accepted after they were accepted in, in foreign countries, in Europe, in the United States. 
Nowadays, it's fashionable to eat quinoa. It's expensive too, you know? And I always tell people that if you go to a farmer's area, not poor farmers or very poor farmers, but poor farmers, but not very poor in Peru, the farmer in Peru eats better or equal to the rich in the United States. Why? Because in the United States, if you have some money, you eat uh, organic chicken. That means chicken that has been fed only grains, corn, not like processed food. Yeah, because we, we know now the effect of this kind of uh, uh, anti antibiotics, no? Antibiotics. That's correct. The, the chickens that you buy in, 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 the, in the market normally, they have a lot of antibiotics because they are being raised in little cages, you know, one next to the other one. They put lights on them so they never sleep. They just eat, 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 eat for four weeks. In four weeks, you kill them and then you sell it. So that's how they make their money. So there are a lot of diseases and they have to inject a lot of antibiotics there. A and rich the flavor, person, the flavor is different. Yeah, a rich person buys a chicken that is raised in an open farm. With they only eat grains, so a poor person in Peru, not very poor, but poor, they have their little farm, they grow their own corn, they feed it to their chickens, so the chicken is raised naturally. And that's what they eat. And they don't eat too much meat because they cannot afford to. So they eat rice and beans with their chicken and some salad in there, just like the rich America. Now the middle class in Peru, it's like the poor in the United States. They want to eat Kentucky fried, McDonald's. The know. fast food. Yeah, the fast food. The comida chatarra, we call it. So that, that, that is culture, that is the culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's but the problem. It, so we absorb that culture there and, and we, we welcome that. We, eat, we, we drink, for example, sodas, gaseosas, and they are very unhealthy to you. You are better off having like uh, jugo de maracuya or some apple juice or some chicha morada, you know, those, those are a lot better. But we don't think that way. We say, no, no, give me Inca Cola, give me Coca-Cola, give me some something that has sweet. And I don't know if this happens in Peru or not, but in Europe, the soda companies cannot use corn syrup. They have to use sugar. But in the United States, they are allowed to use corn syrup. So they don't use sugar. Why? Because corn syrup is a lot cheaper, but it's bad for you. So we are doing that in Peru too. I mean, we sell cheap sodas. They don't have sugar even. They have corn syrup, which is very bad for, for the person. So we allow that. Anyway, so coming back to the common core there, the complaint from the minorities, quote unquote, is that they do not have anything related to their culture in their educational program. And they want that to change there. So of course, other people say, why do I, why does my son, a white person, for example, will say, why does my son or my daughter have to learn about those cultures? Oh, my daughter course. is not from that culture. And the black person says, well, I had to learn a lot about the white culture. Too. We have to learn about each other because we, whether we like it or not, we have to get along. We are a country that is made out of immigrants. So we have to learn the culture of the blacks, the cultures of the Hispanics, the cultures of the white, the cultures of the American Indian. 
So that's talking, what is happening. And some people about, don't. Know that. Talking about American Indian, um, did you see this film, The Dance with Wolf? Dances with Wolf, yes, with Kevin yes. Costner. Kevin Costner, yes. This kind of story, for example, uh, American people know this story. They believe in this story, or uh, because the minorities, the American Indian, may ask to learn this this part of the history of the humanity. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's what they are asking. That's what they are saying. That part of that history has to be part of the history of the whole country, not just for them, but for the Americans to understand it better. And also, if you want to emphasize the economic side of it, just to understand the people better, and that way you create better marketing for those people there. And your company makes a lot more money when you understand your customer there. So there is the, the, the story the history of Canada, uh, I remember to, to this story about the religious people, Catholic people with Indian boys in their kids. They forced them to, to learn to, to be Catholic with a very strong uh, uh, methods. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Not only that, but they abuse them a lot, too. physically and sexually abuse them. Yes, this kind of story, of course, it's not very known in the United States, I, I suppose it's hiding. Yeah, but, but also the history of the slaves was not well known in there. I mean, only now they are saying, okay, actually a boat that came from Africa with 200 slaves of the 200 slaves, only, I don't know exactly, I, 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 have, I don't have an exact idea, but about 25% probably die on the way. You know, they were sick, they were exposed to new diseases. So then they arrived in here, they were, in this, they were, they were property, they were not considered humans. They, they have an owner there. The owner could kill them if, if they protested too much. And they would say that was self-defense. I had to defend myself, so I, I killed him. That's it. Nothing happened to them there. Even recently in Florida, there have been cases where a white person has murdered a black person. And they, they used to be able to get penalized less than in a black, kill the black. So now in the United States, there are a lot of protests. Things are beginning to change because now you have these cell phones. Now everybody has a cell phone here in the United States and you can film it. And sometimes they film what happened. Before it was happening too, but nobody filmed it. And so they, they believe the policeman or the other person, the white person. So that is changing too, but it's not changing fast enough. And the, only, the other thing that they have to realize and a lot of people don't want to realize is that it actually benefits economically and societally to the whole of the United States to get to know each other better, to get to know science better. See, to Say, make sure that your son and your daughter. Uh, I think that science must be really interest of everybody in the United States. Why is not so strong this interest? That's right. And so in order to attract women for science, for example, you must show experiments that relate to women too. For example, you can talk when you teach about optics, what does the creams that women apply to their skin do to the light that reflects on their skin? You know, in the past there was a problem with cameras that didn't take good pictures of black people there. 
because there wasn't enough contrast there. Now they're worrying about it. Not because they are nice, but because they realize there's a big market that they were losing. Before the makeup products, the beauty products were designed for white women there. They were not even designed for the brown skins of Peruvians. Now they have a big market. They are organizing it so that they sell products that fit the skin of a brown woman better that feed the skin of a black woman better there. So they do research on it. Okay, well, but uh, Victor, in fact, as you explained, it will be very difficult to, to get a, a, an agreement. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's, it's very difficult. It would be the same thing as in Peru even though we are a strong Catholic nation, for everyone to agree there, to agree on what to teach. The Catholic Church is not a solid block in there. The, you have the Sodalicium people, for example, which are very conservative, then you have the regular Catholics, then you have the Testigos de Jehová. So they are fractured too. here. They are fractured too, fortunately. Otherwise, they would be very, very strong in there. But they are different religious organizations, different groups. And so they have something in common. They want the God to be the source of everything. So when the, you teach science, you have to acknowledge God in there. And most scientists said, no, I mean, God is not part of the question. I think it was who was who who was the Frenchman that once said they asked him uh, um, he wrote a book about uh, astronomy and they asked him if he mentioned God in their in his book and he said for science it's not necessary to mention God he didn't have anything to do with it so. Okay, well, complicate this uh, controversy in the United States. In Peru, we are, we are also uh, living this kind of controversy. You know, here there is the, the so-called the resistance, the resistencia, the resistencia. Don't touch my kids. Mm. They like to uh, to to learn uh, the classic things, the religious thing, but nothing to do uh, with uh, new ideas about uh, sexual uh, uh, behavior or, uh, or something that uh, is not uh, in agree with uh, the Bible no? <laughs> in Peru. Yeah. Well, here too. In Peru, we don't teach the history of the, the Incas you know, and how their culture, this is my understanding. My understanding is when the Spaniards arrived in Peru, the Indian population, the Inca population was estimated to be around 10 million Peruvians. 50 or 60 years later, that population was reduced to 1 million. The seven to one? 10. 10 to one. Uh. 10 to one, 90%. 90% of it. their musical instruments were burned. It, the church decreed that. It wasn't like somebody who is, was crazy that said that. It was the church that said that represents evil music, so it has to be destroyed. Luckily for us, we had a lot of ceramics. And in the ceramics, we have seen what kind of instruments they had. Of course, and then we have rescued some musical instruments. You can go to the Anthropology Museum. I, I think it was in Pueblo Libre. Uh, and you can see some of the old musical instruments in there. So the, the Peruvians had a very rich musical tradition and then it disappeared. And now in the last 40, 50 years, it has come back. Now it is 
You know, we are proud to have winos. We're beginning to listen to winos there. So that okay. that's and, but uh, but also you you say that it's this kind of controversies in many other countries, but yeah. not. But not in countries like, for example, let's say Sweden, because or Japan, because their population is uniform. So those countries have avoided that problem. The, the population, the ethnological is is the same. There is not kind this kind of controversies. But in United yeah. States, in United States, is, there are many many people. <laughs> Many uh, ethnic, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's it's like in in Chile. In Chile, there is not too much controversy because Chile wiped out most of the Mapuches. There are very few Mapuches only. There are very very few Native Americans in Chile, as opposed to Peru or Bolivia, you know, or Ecuador. Chile is. Uh, the same thing with Argentina. Argentina is mostly white. They don't have many Chile, native. In Chile, in fact, there are also very uh, American contribution in genes. Uh, seems to be there was a, a mixing very rapidly because the history is um, is fighting to take Santiago to retake to etc. Et Who was fighting to retake Santiago? Sorry? Who was fighting to retake Santiago, you said? No, this, the history is the following. The Spaniards, when arrived to Santiago, they took the city, which was Indian, okay? Mm -hmm. So the Indian go out, <laughs> uh, get, uh, then the Indian reconquest Santiago. Mm -hmm. And so on. Uh, it is a continued fighting uh, during uh, two centuries. But, um, you know, uh, the Spaniard was a problem. They didn't get some uh, female for them. No? So the first, the first Spaniard women coming from Spain, of course, were to send to be sent to Santiago for Spaniard soldiers. Okay, mm -hmm. and this fighting and fighting uh, go and back, go and back. This uh, Spaniard uh, violated. How do you say? Right. You know, Huh? Raid. 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 Raid the Indian and the Indian raid the Spaniard women and so on. So in, in two centuries, uh, the Chilean population in Santiago was completely mixed. Uniform mm -hmm. mixed. Uniform mixed. So uh, they, they were no difference, but it's because they were completely mixed. It, it was in the history of, of Santiago. Mm, I didn't know that. Uh, yes, yes. And uh, for this reason, there is no difference in Santiago. Well, uh, there was a difference in the 19th century or uh, because the first uh, German people uh, arrived to Chile, but uh, uh, the two centuries, the beginning, the, uh, the, the first two centuries, the population of uh, Santiago were completely uniform, but mixed. Mm. That was nice then. <laughs> but, um, that is Chile. Uh, it is normal because Chile is not so far from, from Bolivia, from Peru. Uh, Argentina was different, but, but Chile was the same story of uh, Peru. Well, the, uh, now go, going back to the common core, I think, in my opinion, that problem is going to continue and probably get worse in the United States because the United States is fractured. It's very divided now. There are states that are considered what they call red, 
that means Republican, that means conservative. And there are states that are considered blue, which are Democrats, a little bit more liberal. So they are close to being 50, 50%. So the country is divided. So if you live in a red state, the, the schools are going to try to uh, increase the study of religion. For example, there is the strong belief at the federal level, even now, that there has to be and continue to be a separation between religion and state. What it means is that you cannot ask students to pray before class, for example. You cannot teach religion as a school subject. Like in Peru, I don't know what happened to you, but in Peru, when I was in high school, elementary school, I had to have a class in religion. Religion was a course. Yes. I had to pass the course. No, it's voluntary, but uh, it's yeah. special. Situation. Yeah, but in my time, it wasn't voluntary. It was, uh, you yeah, had to yeah. take it. Special, special situation because the you know, Catholic people are uh, Protestant, this, you know, this, Mm -hmm. uh, seven day, uh, uh, there is a discussion between between Christian and Catholics, and so you know, mm -hmm. they don't like to uh, to follow the course of uh, Catholic religion. So they they go out in another kind of um, courses related to to Luther Lutherium. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, here too. I mean, there are, if you want, you can have a religious school. The, the Jews have a yeshivas, they call them. In the yeshivas, some of those schools just teach a lot of religion. So there have been complaints by even the Jewish parents that say, look, I want my son or my daughter to learn religion, but I, when I want them to learn science too. And so those yeshivas are not teaching them science. So now many cities or states are considering not allowing them to give high school degrees to these schools because they're not, they not giving them science, history, et cetera. They're giving them just religion there. And even the parents don't want that because the kid is, is not, is not gonna be able to be a lawyer. is not gonna be able to be a math teacher. It's just being, thought, you know, maybe to have a business and then be a religious person. That's, that's so, and there are other groups like that where the religion is the, the important topic. And some parents don't like that, but once you take your child there, that's a private school that has no funding from the state, they can do that. Okay, but now uh, my my uh, you know my visit to United States. Uh, I went to visit you uh, in in Manhattan. I went to Columbia mm -hmm. University, right. and that was uh, I was uh, surprised because the physics department, the physics building, is very old. Huh? That's right. And, uh, Fifty meters. Further, there is a very modern, a very rich building uh, dedicated to, to business. So American young people, I think, is going to the direction of business and not to, to the direction of science. Is, is it right? Well, that's, that's very bad that, that that is happening, but it is happening. But the United States is still blessed or curse, I don't know, but I would say right now it's blessed, bendecido, of being able to bring students from other countries. In many graduate schools programs, even now, more than 50% of the students are foreign students. If you didn't have those students, you couldn't have a graduate school program in those schools because you didn't have enough Americans to run the school. It wouldn't be possible. 
but if you have foreigners and they come and they teach the labs, como asistente de laboratorio, so they teach the general physics lab for the freshmen and sophomores, first year and second year students. So they are, they are doing a job there. It's not free. They are doing some teaching there. It's like what in Peru we have, los profesores contratados. So these graduate students are like profesores contratados. They are not, they have, do not have a permanent position. They're only there for four or five years till they finish their PhD. And then the United States has the luxury of choosing the best of them to stay in the United States. So that's how the United States still continues to be dominant because most good scientists from Argentina, from Brazil, from Europe, from Russia, from China, still want to go to the United States. Now, those countries are becoming smarter. China and India, now remember China and India together, they have a population of about 2.8 thousand million people. So they represent one third of the earth. They are making policies to make sure that their scientists come back to their countries. They're making policies to bring the Chinese back to China, the Indians back to India. How? They're giving do you know, decent do you know, salaries. Do you, uh, with salaries, you know how? Yeah, <laughs> yeah decent <laughs> salaries. And, and that this is more important the money to build a lab in India or work in a group that has a lab in India. That's the only way because otherwise they decide to stay in the United States. The companies in the United States have realized because they have a long history of that. The, the company IBM, for example, the big corporation there, General Electric there, they have their labs. They know that this, okay, let them do research on the spintronics there. Well, so you say, well, but the spintronics, what I'm gonna do with the spintronics? Well, you may not be able to do anything with the spin, spintronics, but while they are doing that research, they discover other little things that are very practical things. And that's where we make our profit because we patent all the new things that they make. And most of those things don't make any money, but a few of them make a lot of money. So that's how, that's how they know that in the end it's profitable to make money, even if you're doing some kind of research. Okay, in my case, for example, I, I, when I did my PhD thesis, I was examining the magnetomechanical damping of ultrasonic vibration of iron. So you say, <laughs> why are you doing that? I mean, that, what's the use of that? Well, it's just some new frontier in magnetism, but most importantly, how to absorb the shock when something collides with this magnetic material there, because it absorbs a lot of energy. So ideally, if you design a car, with this material, it would absorb more of the energy of the collision. So that could be possible. Now, did we make money? No, we didn't. Did any company build something with this? No, but it was a different way of approaching the problem. It could have worked and there were better ways to do the working, but that's what they do there. They say, look, just let them do research because a person that becomes real scientist all they want is to sit in their labs, think about experiments and do experiments. Some of them, they just sit and do nothing there. That's okay too, that happens. But most of them sit down and do their experiment. They don't say, oh, I have to be there at nine in the morning and I'm going home at five. They go home sometimes at nine in the morning, 10 in the morning, 11 in the morning. They stay there till 10 at night. 11 at night, some nights they stay the whole night there. It depends, but they like what they're doing. 
They love what they're doing. And that usually gives you good products. So that's, that's the faith that the companies have developed. They know that works through experience because IBM has a lot of patents there. They get a lot of patents there. And some patents don't make money, but a few of them make a lot of money. And that is an all. Okay, but, but, but uh, I think uh, Peru is, is in another, in another way, yeah? another direction. Do you know the story of Walter Alba recently published? Yeah, yeah, the, the archaeologist who was working in Sipan, he renovated the Museum of Lambayeque, the, the Brunin Museum in Lambayeque. He was a great scientist and now he, they are giving him about $200 in retirement funds. <laughs> He's very safe. This is the case of Walter Alba, but it's also the case of every scientist working at the university. Yeah? It's not only him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you retire... Engineers, you can... engineers, uh, chemists, physicists, everybody... Um, is going to, to be in the same, the same case as... Uh, That's right. That's why in Peru, all their teachers don't want to retire. Because what are you going to do with $200? It's not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's, um, it's just to wait for, for, for death, no? That's right. Incredible. Well, Victor, Thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, we, see you soon. we are going to, to follow this uh, program. Um, I, I, I'd like to ask you to say some words to students to convince them to learn English. Why English? Huh? Well, I, I, I will put a little warning in there. Maybe in a few years, I'm not sure, but maybe it would be better to learn Chinese. But right That's now, it's true. still true. That's true. You, you have because to learn. In Europe, in Europe my students, um, engineering studying is, is learning Chinese now. So yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I was a graduate student, we had to pass a test of two languages. We have to write, we have to read the paper in, I chose German and French. And uh, so I, because the Spanish is not considered at that time a scientific language. So they didn't accept the Spanish. They say it has to be one of those scientific languages, Chinese, German, French, Russian. Anyway, so I took that test. Now, later, I think two years later, they changed the rule. They said it has to be two languages. One language has to be whatever you choose, and the other one has to be a computer language. So computer language was considered important. And nowadays, most schools that I know, but not all of them, have eliminated the language requirement because now you have translators. So you can translate the paper. Yes, uh, you know, you but, know uh, my thesis in Peru, master's thesis, was with uh, Jose del Prado. It was a physicist who studied in, in Russia. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I heard that. And uh, the, it was uh, on, in a kind of formalism invented by a Russian physicist. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, some uh, 10 pages of, him, of this uh, formula. But now it was translated uh, 10 years ago by CERN, the big document from Russia to English. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was uh, 60 years after he wrote his paper in Russian. So everything is going to English finally for the moment. Huh? That's correct. So this is the time 
of dominance of the English language. So it, it is in your best interest to learn English. And the best way to learn any language is to practice it. And you don't have to be shy. You have to talk. It's normal to make mistakes. Put yourself as a child there. A child, you know, it says, uh, quedo, quedo eto, 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 dame eto. Uh, and the child is not ashamed of speaking badly. He doesn't even have an idea of that. He just says it. But gradually, they learn the language. And that's the attitude you have to have. Just practice the language. And read comic books or watch children's programs. You know, cartoons help you a lot. Because they use some basic words. And also now you are blessed because the students have YouTube and you can listen to songs with the lyrics in there, la letra. You can see the lyrics of the song. So you can read it. Because sometimes and if you just listen to the song in English, it's not easy to understand their English. But if you can read the lyrics, la letra, while you're listening to the song, then it's easier. And listen to simple songs, famous songs, you know, like Elvis Presley, because <laughs> their song has simple language. They, can, they didn't use complicated language. They had uh -huh. to use simple language. Uh -huh. Elvis Presley speaks um, song, sing in a very easy English. Yes, and most of the most of the songs in the that are very famous have to have simple words. Have to. But have I prefer to. I prefer Hotel California. It's not so easy. Eh? Yeah, because if you listen to it, it's very repetitive. It only has counted different. After a while, it repeats itself. Eh? <laughs> like all songs in Peru too, you know, terco, terco, corazón, terco, terco, corazón, pero este terco, terco, corazón. <laughs> it's just repeated. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. See you. See you, my dear followers. See you, friend. Nice to see you. Say hi to everybody. <laughs>